All right, everyone, welcome to Waveform Capnography. My name is Kate Marquis, and welcome to part three. We're going to talk about applications of end title CO2. So if you've joined me before, welcome back. Glad to have you. If not, we're going to have some fun today. Our, object our objectives today are to define waveform capnography, identify the three uses for capnography, to correlate changes in patient condition, with changes in our capnography reading. So throughout this series, we've hit on the first one for sure. We've talked a little bit about the other two, so we're going to get more in depth today about those last two bullet points. So talking about significant numbers, our normal end tidal CO2 is between 35 to 45. So if I see my patient outside that range, I get a little nervous. Please, please, please check your patient. Look at your patient. Are they doing okay? Where are these numbers going? Are they trending up? Are they trending down? Is this something that I would expect of a patient presenting to me in this condition? An example of that would be a pregnant patient. Their normal end tidal CO2 could be between 26 to 34, which again is below the low end of that range. So kind of keep in the back of your head, is this something that is expected for this patient population or do I need to get nervous? At any rate, if you do see someone outside these normal ranges, we really want to think about assessing our patient. Keep in the back of our head that our warning readings here are readings below 20 or above 50, as they are associated with poor outcomes. Now these numbers have some significance. We want to talk about decreased and decreasing end tidal CO2, and we're going to hit on a couple of these today. We're looking at potential hyperventilation. Maybe my patient is taking some really shallow breaths, maybe pulmonary emboli, or maybe even something as bad as cardiac arrest. If I'm looking at increased or increasing end tidal CO2, I'm looking at potentially respiratory acidosis, uh, bronchospasm, or maybe I have ROSC, which is great. Is there a problem? So again, end tidal CO2 is a tool, right? And we need to use it as such. It's only as good as the person that is using the tool, right? Waveform capnography must be utilized in conjunction with clinical judgment. So check your patient, okay? Check your patient first. You see VFib on the monitor, you don't go and say, oh, they're just brushing their teeth. You bust into that room to make sure that they're still alive. And, you know, every once in a while, they look at you confused with a mouthful of toothpaste. Right. So check your patient. Is this what you're expecting to see based on the patient's clinical presentation? Is there a reason why my numbers are too high or too low? Has my patient begun to deteriorate or have they been deteriorating over my couple hour transport or couple hour, 12 hour shift? These are things that we want to keep in the back of our head. If you go in, you assess them, you're like, no, my patient's still in a good place. We did all the lab work. Life is good. Check your device. Okay, you, have a, you may have equipment failure there. So ensure that your device is properly placed on the patient, that you have a good waveform, that your waveform is one in which you expect, right? I expect my patient with a broken leg to have my happy little boxy waveform, that normal looking waveform, but my patient with COPD or asthma, I may see that weird shark fin waveform. So these are kind of things to keep in the back of our head. What am I expecting to see and am I seeing it? and ensure that the system is functioning properly. So let's talk applications. So we're going to talk specifically about medical patients first, and then we'll have a word on trauma patients. Respiratory failure and apnea. But Kate, I have a pulse ox and EKG leads. We good, right? No. And tidal CO2 is phenomenal in detecting these things. It can detect apnea between 10 to 90 seconds sooner than a DSAT noted by the pulse ox. Think about how much stuff you can get done in 10 to 90 seconds. All right, 90 seconds is a long period of time to go in and intervene on that patient before badness really begins to ensue. Right. The respiratory rate, you got to think, if, if you're tracking it with your EKG leads, is derived on how they're placed on the patient and how that patient breathes. You may have a number that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, they're big old belly breathers that might give you a wonky looking number. Maybe you know they don't have a whole lot of chest wall movement and the monitor keeps dinging zero at you and you look at them and they are clearly breathing. 
right? This is more sensitive. In fact, end tidal CO2 can detect paralysis. If you're looking at your intubating, you're RSIing that patient, it'll detect paralysis, um, like the effects of it, faster than physician judgment. So it's a fantastic device, right? It produces a real-time trend of the patient's condition, right? I talked about that a lot before. I've talked about it in every one of these parts that we've talked about. So trending, trending is amazing. Trending is going to show you the direction in which your patient is going. So utilize that information. It'll help you intervene before badness begins to ensue. Increases in entile CO2 may be indicative that your patient is decompensating which may or may not be reflected by your pulse ox readings. Right? Patient can still go into respiratory failure with high pulse ox readings. High pulse ox readings are lagging in terms of numbers. So kind of keep that in the back of your head that that number may or may not be accurate. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten a 98% uh, pulse ox reading on a patient who has taken off their pulse oximeter. I've seen that happen before. The bed has a, you know great pulse ox. It's kind of things we want to keep in the back of our head. They pull off their, their uh, capnography tracer there, whether you're using a mainstream or a sidestream device, you will know right away. Um, additionally, increases in end tidal CO2 may be manifested by increased agitation or anxiety, or if it goes on too long, decreased level of consciousness. Other things we need to keep in the back of our head, our children are going to decompensate faster. Okay, they have that decreased functional residual capacity when compared to their adult counterparts. So they really bear watching much more closely than that, that grown up there, so to speak. Especially when you talk about things like procedural sedation, right? This can detect hypoventilation before hypoxia, okay? Up to two minutes faster. We talked about children already, but per manifold here, sedating medications can cause a rise in end tidal CO2 in children under the age of 16, and and not insignificantly either, okay? There's a mean increase in end tidal CO2 with the study of 6.7 millimeters mercury from midazolam and 8.8 .8 millimeters mercury in ketamine. So these are significant increases in numbers. So when you see those numbers kind of jump up, it, it's not something to get spooked by real quick. It's something to think about and think about what we've actually done to the patient. Is that something that the patient is decompensating or is it something that I caused? Obstructive sleep apnea. Um, Post-op patients with obstructive sleep apnea are obviously at a greater risk for hypoxic episodes. So utilizing and tidal CO2 can be really helpful in detecting these episodes and detecting whether or not you need to intervene. Keep in mind that if you're using side stream devices in these patients, it may not be as reliable because a lot of times these guys are mouth breathers. If you go back to our first presentation, we talked about how the side stream devices are usually connected to that nasal cannula. So you might actually have to move that nasal cannula down and more towards their mouth a little bit in order to get a good reading. Again, we're talking about helpful in identifying hypoxic events prior to changes on the pulse oximeter there. And we're looking at a potential change in our waveform as well for these patients. Shallow hypoventilation may be indicated by a shorter, elongated, and more rounded waveform. Okay, so my, my little boxy guy is getting wider and it's getting more rectangular in shape rather than boxy in shape. All right. And again, this can help us identify episodes of apnea represented by a loss of waveform. So if they're not exhaling, they're not breathing out, you're going to just see that flat line there. Endotracheal tubes, we talked about this in our last presentation, but for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'll run through it real quick. Color metric CO2 detectors are fantastic, and you know I worked in the ED, and that's one of the first devices that our physicians will go to when checking to make sure that their tube is in the right place. But honestly, it's a glorified piece of litmus paper. It's only good for one use. Purple is poor, Barney is bad, yellow is yes, means you're in the right place, but it's one and done, okay? I can't continue to check and see if my, my tube has become dislodged or if it has um, 
bright main stemmed or something like that. So by having waveform capnography, I can have a waveform and numeric changes if my tube becomes dislodged or if it right main stem. So I kind of get that biphasic waveform, that kind of cliff that kind of keeps climbing there. Or if I have a cuff leak, I get this kind of rounded shape. Additionally, waveform capnography can detect paralysis faster than physician judgment. And I've already talked about that a little bit. It's fantastic. Why wouldn't you go in and, and start working on securing that airway faster if you can if you can, if you have the opportunity, if you know it happens sooner, why would you wait any longer than you had to before putting the tube in and giving patients the, the breaths that they need, right? They can't take those deep breaths if they're paralyzed. This is going to detect issues with ventilation before the onset of hypoxia, and it's going to aid clinicians in the prediction of respiratory failure. And these are ongoing themes that you'll see throughout this presentation, throughout my past presentations as well. Waveform capnography allows me to act faster to prevent bad outcomes with my patients. Pulmonary emboli. So a lot of work is being done with uh, pulmonary emboli and kind of correlating end tidal CO2, all of that kind of good stuff. So what happens when someone has a PE? Well, we have an increase in our alveolar dead space. So we may have a flattened slope of phase three. Now keep in mind that that normal waveform we looked at, it kind of had a, a upgoing slope there in phase three. So I'm looking at a flatter slope. May, may show me that there's a problem. What you'll note is that they have a low end tidal CO2, but if you were to get an ABG on these guys, they're going to have a high PaCO2. Okay, now why why is that happening, Kate? Well, we have all of that alveolar dead space, so my exchange at that capillary membrane is not happening. Okay, so my patient is now building up all this CO2, which is why they have a high PaCO2, and they're not able to breathe off as much of it, which is your end tidal CO2. It's, it's what they are breathing off. So that's why you have this really high gradient. Now, there's potential in the future to utilize capnography as a rule-out mechanism with a negative D-dimer in low-risk patients, but again, uh, more work needs to be done in this. So keep Keep your eyes peeled, stay tuned as more and more studies are done. Asthma or COPD, uh, we talked a little bit about this in my last presentation as well. Asthma and COPD are obstructive diseases, so you see patients breathing out, they have that prolonged expiratory phase, right, which is why you see this extended phase three here, okay? There is no cool plateau there, it's this really long kind of shark width a uh, shark fin waveform, okay, or it kind of reminds me of Finding Nemo here, right? Keep in mind that patients who are in a bad way may have an initial fall in their end tidal CO2, followed by a rapid rise as the patient begins to decompensate, okay? Not able to blow off enough as they begin to decompensate here. Malignant hyperthermia, any of you guys are healthcare providers, you know, Jayco has made this a big point, in recent years. Uh, this is a result of a reaction to anesthetic agents, and our pediatric populations are especially vulnerable. This is an autosomal dominant trait, and basically what we have here is uncontrolled calcium release that activates the calcium pumps uh, to reuptake calcium or transport to the extracellular space, which causes heat, okay? So you have this hypermetabolism that leads to an increase in CO2 production as a result of the requirement of more oxygen. Okay, You're going to see hyperkalemia, hyperlactateemia, and acidosis as a result from a disruption in the cellular membrane integrity. So we're going to see high, high, high levels of end tidal CO2. So what we need to do is treat our reversible causes. Um, so usually it's dantrolene, so 2.5 milligrams per kilogram as a loading dose, or if, if there is a generic version of dantrolene. So things to kind of keep in the back of your head, especially if you are RSIing patients or you work in the operating room, uh, it's always applicable, right, this fabulous tool that you have here. Let's talk seizures, all right? 
So with seizures, we're going to see an initial transient increase in entitled CO2 during the seizure or when postictal. Okay. Prolonged increases in entitled CO2, despite the ability to maintain a normal or high pulse ox reading, may indicate impending respiratory failure. Okay, again, that SpO2 is lagging. It's not really showing a good picture of what that ventilatory status is, whereas entitled CO2 will show that good picture. Okay, so kind of keep that in the back of your head when we're looking at this, when you're looking at your seizure patients, when you're trending them, right? Because again, this is a tool here. When you're trending our numbers here, look for those increases because if you do see that, your patient may be in a worse position than you initially thought. Sepsis. This is also a big point here, especially in the healthcare setting. Um, per Hunter and his cohort there, there's an inverse relationship between serum lactate levels and end tidal CO2. So let's kind of think about that, talk that through for a minute, right? So my serum lactate levels are high. That means I have metabolic acidosis. So my body's going to say, I need to compensate for that. So we're going to end up with respiratory alkalosis. Okay, they're going to keep breathing that off and breathing it off more and more and more. They're hyperventilating in an effort to drive down that end tidal CO2 to compensate. Okay, patients with lower end tidal CO2 levels. So my patients who are working harder to drive down that metabolic acidosis as a result of sepsis have worse outcomes, which makes sense, right? They're working harder. They're going to have worse outcomes. Um, and tidal CO2 cannot be used alone, but should be utilized in conjunction with serum lactate levels when you're looking at sepsis. So this is just something else to consider. It's another tool in the toolkit. Utilize it to help you go forward and, and treat this patient. Metabolic acidemia is also something that um, a lot of work is being done around here. So we're talking about things like diabetic ketoacidosis or gastroenteritis. Um, more information is coming, so this is something really interesting to kind of stay tuned with. So metabolic acidemia, again, we just kind of talked about that. It's going to cause the body to compensate. So you're going to, again, see those low end tidal CO2 numbers. And you can see there is a significant correlation between end tidal CO2 and PaCO2. So some studies suggest utilizing end tidal CO2 to help rule out DKA in both the adult and pediatric patients. And a lot of these studies have been shown to have some pretty good efficacy in excluding metabolic acidemia. But more studies are really required to determine specific levels for them to be able to rule out uh, DKA or acidemia. Cardiac arrest, right? Decreasing entitled CO2 may indicate decreasing cardiac output. Uh, this may be for a myriad of reasons, such as hemorrhage, pneumothorax, tamponade, MI. The American Heart Association recommends the utilization of capnography during CPR because it's going to give you some really fabulous numbers, and it's going to tell you how you're doing. It's great feedback. An entitled CO2 below 10 indicates poor CPR. So what do we do to fix poor CPR? We either tell the person who's doing CPR to do a better job, push harder, push faster, or we switch out with them. A gradual decline may also be associated with other mechanisms that produce poor cardiac output, like the ones that I just talked about. An entitled CO2 between 10 to 15 means you got to think about it. We need to continue to optimize our CPR. So maybe that person is just tall enough to do CPR while standing. Maybe we want to think about going and getting them a stool. Or maybe we're doing CPR on a stretcher in the ED or on a bed on the floor. Maybe we want to put a hard board underneath them and by utilizing that hard board it's going to optimize our CPR. We really want our entire CO2 between to be between 15 to 20, ideally 20 is kind of that magic number there, um, which will indicate good CPR. Keep in mind that end tidal CO2 may slightly increase during the first few minutes of CPR as we're getting better output there. But an abrupt rise in end tidal CO2 may indicate ROSC. So it's a great physiologic indicator of ROSC. You see it jump up on you from that fabulous 20. You were doing great high quality compressions all the way up to 40, 50, 60 kind of right off the bat there. 
So these are great things to kind of keep in mind. Um, I don't suggest just doing it while you're using CPR, while you're doing CPR. I suggest before and after, which will really help you keep an eye on that patient's status. Let's talk about trauma patients, all right? Because not every patient's a medical patient. So here's a word on trauma patients. Capnography should be utilized in conjunction with patient assessment and clinical decision-making skills. How many times have you guys heard me say that, both today and in other presentations? It's a tool. Utilize it as a tool. So keep in mind that carbon dioxide is the great vasodilator. So we see someone who we think is herniating, whether it's from a head injury or a stroke or, or, or what have you. Um, we see someone herniating. What is the first thing that we do? We bag, 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 bag them, right? We hyperventilate them. What that's doing is that is driving down carbon dioxide levels, right? So by driving down my CO2 levels in the blood, I am causing vasoconstriction. Whereas if I hypoventilated them, uh, I would cause vasodilation. So by causing vasoconstriction, we talk about our Monroe Kelly doctrine where uh, your brain is in a fixed vault there, that would be your skull, and in order to increase our, our intracranial pressure or decrease it, you need to either add stuff or take stuff away. By causing that vasodilation, we're buying ourselves more time, we're creating more room in that skull there. So what we want to do, honestly, we really want to avoid that hyperventilation if we can, because there are worse outcomes for patients who have low CO2 levels. So we want to keep them normal. Our capnography can help us keep them normal and help us hopefully avoid the need to, to go in and, and do a whole bunch of hyperventilation there. So capnography can be utilized in conjunction with serial ABGs to optimize the perfusion, both the adult and pediatric patient. Right. Talk about blunt trauma. Blunt traumas to the chest may decrease perfusion due to cardiac or lung injury and thus affecting our end tidal CO2. Um, per uh, Long, Kaufman, and I cannot even pronounce that name, but that person's name is there. There is a high survival rate in patients who maintain an end tidal CO2 closer to normal than those with low end tidal CO2. So their study uh, was patients with an end tidal CO2 of 30 versus 25, and they noticed that those with 30 or better had better outcomes. Um, whereas 25 and below more often than not resulted in death. Okay. Penetrating trauma, there's an inverse relationship with serum lactate. So values less than 35 may indicate a need for transfusion, which is kind of wild. So again, things that they're continuing to do studies on to kind of keep in the back of your head um, when you're looking at, at values here. Finally, we talk about tourniquet use after talking about penetrating trauma there. When removed, you may see a transient increase in end tidal CO2. So again, my patient's end tidal CO2, is that because of them or is it because of something that I did? These are some things to kind of keep in the back of our head here. So in summary, it's a lot of information, a very short period of time. Um, decrease, decreasing end tidal CO2 may indicate a couple different things. Um, including hyperventilation, cardiac arrest, pulmonary emboli, versus increasing or increase in tidal CO2, malignant hyperthermia, bronchospasm, and ROSC. And tidal CO2 is an effective methodology to monitor a patient's ventilatory and perfusion status. I'm looking for the typical rectangle flavored waveform with that little slope up in phase three there. My expected numeric values are between 35 and 45, but if they are outside those ranges, one, check your patient, and two, think, is this expected? Is this something that I can expect for this patient and it's going to be okay? Or do I need to go and intervene? Changes may be an early sign of decompensation, right? So trend your patient, trend all the numbers, use it as a tool, and if they do fall outside those normal values and you can't explain it away, Go check your patient. I want to thank you guys for joining me on my three-part series, and I hope that this has been helpful.